So we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. And I'm, like I said, we are going to be going to New York City. Um, our speaker today is Olivia Berkland, and she has been a museum educator for the Frick Collection for almost a decade, during which she has engaged visitors and students of varying ages and backgrounds in dialogical experiences with art objects from a variety of different centuries and countries. She holds degrees from Brown University and Bank Street Graduate School of Education. Olivia has also taught art history at Rutgers University, Newark, and is also a lecturer at the Jewish Museum in New York City. And she's thrilled to have the opportunity to come and join us today to give us highlights from the Frick Collection. So with that, I want to say welcome, Olivia. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> no, no problem. So Thank real quick, so much. Yes, yeah. real quickly, how, how's the weather back in New York? Well, today it's a bit gray uh, and chilly. It's probably in the mid-30s, so we're all wearing coats. <laughs> uh, but yesterday was a beautiful spring day and the daffodils are up. So oh, spring is coming. <laughs> well, again, thank you so much for joining us. And please, we're looking forward to hearing about treasures from the Frick. Treasures from the Frick. Okay, great. So I just want to start off, first of all, thanking you and, and thank you to um, Saddleback College. And yes, we are going to New York. Um, so uh, I'm going to screen share my presentation with you and show you, uh, discuss the Frick collection, the building, Henry Clay Frick, and do some close looking at two objects within the uh, collection itself. So hold on one second. All right, how's that? Does that look good? Can you see it? Great. Um, so this is New York City, uh, looking quite lovely. Uh, it's, um, this is the Frick Collection and it's the Frick Mansion. Um, this was created by a man named Henry Clay Frick, who was a steel magnet uh, during the turn of the century. And this was built uh, between 1912 and 1914. It was his last home. Uh, it was designed by Thomas Hastings, uh, who was quite popular at the time. And he wanted, uh, Frick wanted it to be in the style of the Italianate, you know, Italianate Renaissance. And so it's a combination. The interior speaks to the Gilded Age with heavy velvets and things that um, Elsie Wolf, who was an interior designer at the time, would have been quite proud of. Um, but uh, the exterior actually speaks more to uh, classical, you know, to Renaissance Italy. Um, it's situated on Fifth Avenue and 70th Street on the Upper East Side in Manhattan. And um, it is a beautiful location because to the left here is Central Park. Uh, and so all the rooms here look out on the park. Um, and in fact, you'll see a room that uh, eventually I'll show you called the Fragonard Room, which is surrounded by beautiful pastoral landscapes uh, done in the 18th century. And it, and it has mirrors and it reflects the exterior of the park and this garden, actually this beautiful garden um, that is part of the mansion um, inside and out. So it, it's, it's a lovely location. Um, it was originally put on the site of the Lenox Public Library. Um, but what happened was the New York Public Library at the time uh, decided to build their building uh, down on what is the famous 42nd Street building with the lions. And so uh, they destroyed actually that building and um, which is unfortunate for archives and history. Um, but they then took that, the sale of that property to build the New York Public Library. And it was fortunate for Frick because then he could build on this site. Um, it is a very old building. And so because of that, they have to do renovations and they're extending it a little bit. So uh, they, right now it's under construction. Uh, they're gonna add an education section. And um, so if you come to New York, it's gonna be very welcoming to you because we'll be done fairly soon, probably in the next year, year and a half. So uh, it will have a restaurant and um, you'll be able to walk up here onto the second floor, which was where Frick's home was. That's where his 
he lived with his wife Adelaide and his um, daughter Helen. He had a son, Childs, um, but he was basically out of the house by the time he moved in here. So these were originally bedrooms. Uh, and then the second floor was dining room, library, living room. And then actually he built a gallery, um, to, two galleries to house his collection. So because it's under construction, the uh, Frick was fortunate enough to discover that this building, which was built to be a museum originally um, for the Whitney, which then moved downtown, uh, it was vacant. And so they were able to put um, a large part of the collection here. And so if you come to New York tomorrow, you can come and see the collection in this building. This was designed in the 60s. It's extremely different than the mansion, but it actually, um, it, it, it's a wonderful chance to see these objects in a completely different environment. And um, the curators have done an amazing job organizing it according to um, nations and countries and then time periods. So it's, it's nice to see it in a different context. Um, this building was built in the 1960s, as I said, 1968 by Marcel Breuer. It's done in what they call the brutalist style. Um, and it looks sort of like an upside down ziggurat. Uh, it's very intentional that it should have this overhanging and sort of uh, a sort of heavy feeling and very, uh, um, it's done with concrete in the interior. Um, just a little bit about Henry Clay Frick. Uh, he was born in 1849 uh, to, and he died actually at the house in the mansion in 1919. Um, he was born outside of Pittsburgh in West Overton, Pennsylvania. Um, his mother came from a family that had some money. They had made it in the distillery world, in the whiskey world. Um, and so he was fortunate enough to have some seed money to um, invest in land that was rich in a sort of form of coal. And he and his two partners at the time created um, a company that, um, trans that transformed coal into um, a form of coke, it's called coke, that helped create fortified steel. And this of course was a very good time to do it because railroads were going across America. Um, so he, um, he partnered eventually with Andrew Carnegie to, um, and they then ran US Steel together, which was a huge, uh, huge company. Uh, and so he became a huge steel magnate and then um, industrialist, uh, financier, but he was also a philanthropist. Um, and to the right here is Adelaide, his wife. Um, he did have actually four children, two of whom had died very early on in his life. Um, and then uh, Childs and Helen. Helen uh, actually went on to uh, work at the Frick and um, expand its collection. Actually about a third of the collection is um, from her choice, from her picking. And um, she was on the board and she also created um, the Frick library, the Frick reference library called Faro. Um, and they have great uh, uh, remote resources. So if you ever wanna go on there and find old archives or um, photographs, it's a amazing resource. So feel free to look that up as well. Um, like many of um, these robber barons of this time, um, his life, uh, Frick's life was quite checkered. Uh, he had, he was very anti-union. Um, and this was the time of course when unions were coming to the fore. So, um, and in particular, um, I think I see a question in the chat. Is that, do you see that Eva Marie? Hold on, I just wanna. Oh, um, I, yes, yes, I do. Yes. I, I, uh, where were any of Vermeer's works loaned to the Rijks Museum exhibition? Yes, Mary, they were. And I'm going to get to that. So thank you so much for bringing it up because that's what I'm going to just a little bit of what I'm going to discuss today. Uh, so uh, in fact, if we just go back here, um, the, re the reason why so um, Frick bought three uh, Vermeer pa paintings by Vermeer. And, um, but he had in his, um, in his will basically that um, they couldn't travel. They had to remain in the mansion. However, because they actually were moved to the Breuer, they, the museum had the opportunity to share them 
with to put them on loan. And so the Rijks Museum now has the three um, Vermeer paintings that one of which I'll be discussing today. Uh, uh, they, it's in Amsterdam right now. They're all, all three of them are in Amsterdam. So it's, it's quite a big deal. And it's one of the biggest, it, for those who don't know, it's one of the biggest retrospectives of Vermeer's work um, in history uh, in Amsterdam. And some, some Vermeers have been discovered in the course of this exhibition. So it's, it's, um, we're not sure if they really are Vermeers, but uh, his oeuvre is something between 34 and 36 paintings, they think, worldwide. Um, and now we're not sure what the number is. So, um, so just circling back, uh, this is sort of a violent image, unfortunately, but it's part of Frick's history. Uh, he was involved in what um, history calls the Homestead Strike of 1892. And what happened was uh, some of his workers went on strike at the factory and uh, they couldn't come to terms with the negotiations. Frick wasn't, um, didn't want to concede to most of the demands. And so there broke out a fight. He brought in his militia, uh, not his militia, excuse me. He brought in Pinkerton police. Uh, and then the fight got so violent that state militia came in to settle things down. So, and in the interim, uh, nine union members and three Pinkerton agents were killed. So it was a very upsetting um, event in history and for Frick's past. Uh, Carnegie and Frick over that time period um, didn't agree on a lot of things and it strained their future relationship to the point where later on he uh, left US Steel. About seven years after this, hold on, let me just uh, he moved to New York uh, and in 1905, and he, during that time, he rented from the Vanderbilts, uh, a beautiful home, uh, and uh, was surrounded by their collection. And um, in that time period, uh, he built this, his mansion, uh, which, as I said before, was started in 1912 and 1914, he moved in. Um, one of the things about his collecting habits or the way that he collected was very typical of the time. And so the Vanderbilts, the Astors, the Morgans collected quite a bit from Europe and quite a bit from the English. Uh, and his collection in total combined with his daughter's um, choices as well, covers mostly Western European uh, art and uh, decorative arts from the 1300s to the late 1800s. And um, there's really only one American painting. If you don't, uh, if you don't consider Whistler an American painter, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, uh, there is um, Gilbert Stewart here. Uh, and this is George Washington. So what we're looking at now is the library, his library, uh, pretty much the way it was when he lived here. This is a portrait of him. Uh, he would have just had more furniture. Uh, and if you see here, this is almost all English paintings. So these two are from Turner, this is Hogarth, and this is Lawrence. And um, by T.E., I mean, um, by uh, Thomas Lawrence. And it's of a very wealthy, um, important noble woman, um, Lady Peel. And um, that's a typical example where what happened, uh, they collected mostly from England at that time because the English economy was in a downturn. And a lot of these landed aristocracy um, uh, needed money. And so they sold some of their paintings. And so this Lady Peel was sold by the Peel family actually on secret in order to pay off some debts. It's a big scandal in the family, I think. <laughs> but, um, and so it was such a to-do that the magazine um, Puck actually did a cartoon of this where American dollars are just collecting um, all sorts of artifacts from Egyptian pieces, which of course now these things are um, controversial in all sorts of collections um, and in Europe and uh, elsewhere. So just as a sense of it, but he also, you know, as time went by, you know, was more experimental. His idea, the, the idea behind the collection and the building of the house came from a visit that he took with Andrew Mellon, who he knew from Pittsburgh. Um, 
um, Mellon, I don't know if you know, was quite a wealthy you know, family at the time. And eventually they went on to be involved with the National Gallery of Art in DC. Um, but he went to visit the Wallace Collection in London. And uh, that, if you ever go see it, is very, very similar to the Frick Collection, um, particular with Fragonard paintings here that you see to the right. This is one of the rooms in the collection. Uh, this is an entire room that Frick tried to recreate the sense of 18th century France. Um, and all of these paintings here are collected by, are done by Jean-Honoré Fragonard. Uh, and all of the pieces are from that same time period. This chest here, this commode it's called, was owned by Louis XV's daughter. Um, and it, it speaks very much to Rococo um, art. And these windows here to the right actually look out on Central Park. So this is the room I was talking about where there's these beautiful gardens in the interior that sort of reflect the garden and the exterior. And here to the left, we have Rembrandt's self-portrait. We have the two Turners. And at the end, we have two paintings by the Italian artist Veronese. He also collected bronzes, Italian bronzes and Cassoni here. Um, and there's this uh, sort of idea that his grandchildren would come in and they would look at these bronzes and like them the most because they were of their size kind of idea. Um, so um, today I'm going to focus mostly on two paintings. Um, one is uh, by Johannes Vermeer, uh, as Mary had brought up earlier, and uh, the other is by um, Giovanni Bellini. So um, this painting is quite large, actually. It's, I think, 31 by 36 inches. So it's very, very large. I'll show you a picture of it in a second in the gallery. Um, it's an oil on canvas. And it was called Mistress and Maid by someone later on, a collector later on. It was not called this by Vermeer. Um, I'm just going to show you. Uh, and here we have, um, they think this might be the back of Vermeer. But this. He did a self-portrait. Uh, and if the, for those who don't know Vermeer, um, one of his most famous paintings is A Girl with a Pearl Earring. There was a movie created uh, by a book by Tracy Chevalier um, about uh, the life of this painting. Um, uh, some of it's historically inaccurate, but it's still very entertaining. <laughs> Um, and uh, this is one of the most well-known. It's it, this one is a it's a trony. They call it a trony, which is usually a portrait of someone that most people wouldn't know necessarily. That it, it's a portrait done for the open market, and they usually would wear exotic uh, clothing. Um, and one of the things that stands out about Vermeer is that he is mysterious, and there's very little known about him. And strangely enough. There's um, his paintings themselves create this sense of mystery, uh, which um, we'll talk about, you know, I'll talk about in a second. But he was, you know, called the Sphinx of Delft by um, uh, this art collector from the 19th century who actually rediscovered him. Uh, uh, and uh, I think it's an apt moniker. Okay, so here we have the three paintings that are owned by the Frick that are now on loan at, to the Rijksmuseum. Uh, this one, uh, let's see, this one is the earliest. And then uh, Officer Laughing Girl is next. And then of course, this one is the last. Um, and he uh, bought, this one was the first one he bought. Then he bought this one in 1911. And then by the 1919, so right, um, huge increase in price. And it was also Frick's last painting that he bought and one of his most favorite. Uh, it was so difficult to get that you really know that it was one of his favorites because it was right at the end of World War I. And there were, it was a German uh, that owned it in Germany and he had to get from the State Department a license to trade with the enemy, quote unquote, in order to acquire it. So, um, but it was, I think, extremely worth the effort, if nothing else. Um, just a little bit about the Sphinx of Delft. Um, Vermeer uh, was born in Delft in um, 
in the Dutch Republic in 1632. And at that point, Delft was a very small but very prosperous city. Um, he was trained his uh, he was trained as a cloth weaver. That's what his father did. Um, but eventually his father became an innkeeper. Um, and um, that later on, then Vermeer actually did have that in as well. But Vermeer himself became mostly a painter, as we know, and also an art dealer. So he had exposure to art from, you know, Amsterdam and Leiden, I'm sure. And that art came from around the world. Um, it's unclear if he ever trained with anyone. We don't know. There are guesses that maybe he studied under Abraham Bomert or Leonard Bremer. Um, and his training didn't, uh, you know, he, he started in the 1640s, they think, and it's postulated that, um, that he was studying under them, but maybe then he studied under somebody else. And so he has a, a sense of Car you know, Caravaggio-like um, qualities in his paintings. Um, he was born to a Protestant family. He married a Catholic woman in 1653, and her name was Katarina Bolas. Um, and sometime after their marriage, the couple lived with Katarina's mother in the Catholic quarter in Delft. Um, we don't know if he was converted to Catholicism. Um, many people say that he, he did. Um, and some of his paintings may reflect that, but there's no knowledge of that um, per se. And he was actually buried in the Protestant old church. Um, so it's unclear. Um, and he was, he was not known by the time he, I mean, he was known at his time, but then he, he fell out of favor. His art fell out of favor, which I think is so interesting. The trends of art have that. It, it changes through time. Um, he read. He was registered for the um, with the Guild of Saint Luke um, as a master painter, and that indicated that he had by then completed the requisite six years of apprenticeship. Uh, and at the beginning of his career, he produced a small number of mythological and biblical scenes and cityscapes, but then eventually moved on to genre painting. And this is where I want to get onto this. This is. Um, uh, the painting in Mistress and Maid in the galleries. So it's quite large, so you get a sense of, of it. You know, and the three, the two other ones we saw are really quite small. I mean, smallish. They're about the size of a microwave. So this is almost double of that. Uh, and here we are. So this is considered a genre painting. Um, genre paintings came to the fore in the Dutch Republic, uh, in particular, because they were a new republic. They had recently been freed of Habsburg, uh, uh, you know, well, for lack of a better word, I'm gonna say tyranny, but still, <laughs> um, in, by the peace of Westphalia. And so they created their, they, had a, they were a new republic without royalty, um, but they were also an extremely wealthy republic. And that is because they founded in 1602, the Dutch East India Company. Um, and that is a whole history in and of itself. Um, it was one of the largest European commercial trade companies in Asia with almost 5,000 ships and held a virtually a monopoly on the spice trade, as well as trading coffee, textiles, and luxury goods. Its system of trading posts, settlements, colonies across East and Southeast Asia is established through a series of wars and sometimes even massacres. Um, so they made quite a bit of money in this trade. Um, and so the merchant class then, of course, rose up because uh, they, and they were wanting paintings for their homes. Um, which Vermeer then benefited from. So, uh, and they wanted paintings of their homes and um, not necessarily they had portraits of themselves, but instead of having um, history paintings, which was of the trend, they wanted uh, interiors, things that showed off possibly their wealth. Um, and so frequently you'll see these genre paintings among other artists like Ter Roche or, um, many other painting painters at the time that show off these beautiful homes uh, with checkerboard floors and um, uh, beautiful objects in them. And here we actually see them here. Uh, so here to the left, we have this lovely writing box that probably held this ink, um, this ink cup and this ink jar 
Um, and maybe they held, uh, there are secret compartments in here that you can pull out and probably you could put letters inside. The box they think is from India, from Goya, India. And I think that because it was actually in Vermeer's um, inventory when he died. Um, the, this, this apron here is made from lapis lazuli, the pigment that he used to paint it. So the pigment, the way he painted, this is oil on canvas, but the actual pigment, of course, was not through tubes, but was through um, minerals. They would get stones and of beautiful colors, and lapis lazuli is a stone that is harvested, um, or not harvested, but it's found in Afghanistan and Iran. Um, and it, in the inside, when you crack it open, of course, it's this amazing color blue. And, uh, but it's extremely expensive to bring. And so it speaks to the imports that were coming through the Dutch Republic. Um, but he would then grind down this uh, stone to give it a powdery substance and mix it with an oil and then paint. And he gives this beautiful color to the maid's apron. Um, and this is a form of ultramarine, which may have had a tinge of it as well. He mixed other colors. Um, this pearl, which is very famous, that was um, that you also see in Girl with a Pearl Earring. Um, it was probably made out of tin, actually, they think. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. Um, uh, because it, of the way it weighs on her ear, it's very light, actually. And it's very unusual to have found a pearl that large. Um, these seed pearls probably were real. Um, um, but this also speaks to the idea that this jacket, which is this beautiful, sumptuous yellow, um, the ermine here, this was all probably local. Uh, the, the jacket itself is made out of not ermine itself, but um, probably a local animal, <laughs> sorry to say, <laughs> like a cat or something, and then it was painted. Um, and uh, the silk was probably locally made. Um, he, be, genre paintings also are idealized interiors. So when you look at them, they're not usually realistic, right? They're, they're idealized. And he, uh, Vermeer was very attuned to that. And so he creates these sort of fantasy worlds to the point where it's very theatrical in a funny way because he uses the same props in many of his paintings. Um, so for example, Let's see here. So here we see the same yellow jacket. They called it a yaka. And it would have been a house jacket, actually, believe it or not, um, for wealthy women. Um, uh, and we also see the same writing box. And um, I'll get to this idea of writing and women in a second, but I just want to point out that here again, she is writing with this writing box and the ink wells here. Um, this painting. Um, is uh, actually at the National Gallery in DC uh, and was done just a few years before uh, the one that we're discussing. I also want you to note just here, you see the window here. This was frequently almost in almost all of them in all of Vermeer's paintings, the light comes from the left and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and they think it's because he lived in a house um, with his 11 children um, and he probably worked in the studio where the window was on the left. Having said that, the patterning on the windows always changed. So he was, you know, it's always, again, this sense of what works for the image. Um, so it's not a direct reflection of the space, but more a reflection of the space and his imagination. Um, I would say some of the things that are most accurate about his painting is the lighting, uh, which is beautifully done and I'll discuss more. Um, so um, letters and women. The Dutch Republic, because it was a newly founded republic, they were very uh, happy and encouraging of women to learn how to read and write, which was relatively new among the middle class, starting you know in the 1600s. So, um, and they were they were somewhat proud of it. Uh, of women in literacy and to the point where we're not even sure if even the maid in the painting that we're going to discuss more was also literate, um, which would be quite remarkable um, at that time. 
Um, and so we have many genre paintings with women in letters. And these two are by Vermeer. Um, and again, they it reflects not only this sort of uh, national pride of women in literacy, but it also reflects something that Vermeer is very, uh, you know, uh, good at actually, is just about showing women and interiority, about how you can actually show someone looking down and reading and try to think about what they're thinking. And, and you know, in a way, just even this reflection here is so beautifully done, you know, about, here she is reading, thinking, what is she thinking about? Here, you know, is she pregnant? We don't know. Um, it could have been the style of the dress at the time. Um, but then he gives us indicators of maybe what is going on. So here there's a map. And because much of many of uh, the merchant class were traveling with the um, Dutch East India Company, it could have something to do with that. It could have something to do with nationhood. Um, and here we have actually a big image of Cupid. So frequently genre paintings with letters and frequently they were with men and women, these paintings as well, just across the board, they would often be about love. Uh, and so um, they may have bought these paintings uh, because they were about love uh, in a funny way. And you have this open window, um, you know, what does that mean, this opening? She's revealed by a curtain, um, also very interesting. And just as another, you know, embarrassment of riches, these beautiful textiles that were imported and they were so well, you know, expensively made with beautiful uh, materials that they didn't put them on the floor, they used them on tables. Um, in fact, with letters and love letters in particular, they had even manuals um, that the women would follow and the men would follow as to how to write an appropriate love letter. So it was really a, a trope that existed at the time. Um, just other things, props that he used, these chairs show up quite frequently. Uh, this one shows up even in the, uh, a Frick painting that we have. Um, just, you know. And then here is another one that I think is very much related to the one that is at the Frick right now. Um, this one is in the National Gallery of Ireland. It was done probably three or four years after the one that sat the Frick. And here we have um, a pattern window, but it's a very different window and the light coming down. And a woman who's wearing almost the identical, um, you know, costume as one at the Frick, again with the blue apron and the brown dress. Um, and she is writing which is the, the same idea. Now, the interaction between them is very, very different. And with the lighting and this nuanced interaction, why is she looking out the window? Well, she, is she just waiting? Is there something that she's contemplating? And again, we wonder, like, what is this? You know, what is this a tip off, basically, of what's going on? Um, and that is a, a painting of Finding of Moses. So it's a biblical image. Um, it's unclear. Uh, it, you know, there are lots, lots and lots of interpretations as to about this painting in particular that I won't go into today. But um, also, I just want to show you the Delft tiles. Delft is known for its tiles even to this day, and this beautiful patterning, uh, marble patterning. I mean, you know, Vermeer was incredible at um, perspective and blending of rich, rich colors and his use of light. Um, uh, one second here. Um, there was also this, this trope of women in maids at the time. It even was in France. I don't know if you think of Moliere and some of his plays where there's a saucy, you know, maid that comes forward and tells you all the family secrets. Um, and here we have a painting by another artist, a contemporary uh, premier, Nicholas Meiss. Um, and here he's showing this, this, you know, matron of the house looking down at the maid who is sleeping instead of doing the cleaning. I wouldn't say it's a particularly nice <laughs> feeling to be conveying, but it is something, you know, it's supposed to be slightly comedic. Um, and uh, that's very different than what Vermeer tries to do, but it's definitely a trend that was going on at the time. Uh, and the, the trope extends in very different ways, like this is a Vermeer painting. Um, maids 
could be um, bringers of the love letters. They could have read the letters and been in on the tryst. Um, and so you have here this woman, it, it, you know, wearing the same outfit again, right? Um, is looking at the mistress of the house who's wearing the same um, at the letter. Does she know what's in the letter? She's holding um, an instrument, which is frequently a tip off, you know, a symbol of, of love, right? That instrument, you know, music, it's harmony. Um, and again, we have paintings in the background of ships having to do with sailing. Um, and this whole idea that we, as we're moving towards this image, we're passing through a passage, a secret passage of other things, you know, going on in their life. And again, this sort of curtain being pulled back, right? So this theatrical idea, but we're peering into a hidden world. You know, we as viewers are, are moving into a space that maybe we shouldn't be. And, um, but their dynamic is very different than the brick portrait uh, painting. And here we are at the one that's, well, at the Rijksmuseum now, but is normally at the Frick. Um, and it, this is a very interesting relationship between these two women. Um, first of all, compositionally, she's standing in the sort of, you know, if you divide it, they both are in the center of their own portraits, which is very interesting. Um, and that she is scale wise and compositionally, she's very tall and quite large in relation to the woman. So even though the light is hitting the mistress with all this yellow and she's bursting with like sunlight, you know, with the light coming through from the left again, right? Um, brightening up this, this beautiful yellow. And then, you know, the electrifying her hair and then off her earring. And then it also is here to the left, right? Coming through and showing his ability to do upholstery and drapery. Um, but she also gets this sense of power because not only the light hits this crisp edge of this letter and the light hits her face so beautifully. This woman is obscured. We don't know what's going on in her face. And Frick, I mean, uh, excuse me, Vermeer was very good at creating this sort of tension, this mystery, because the face, he obscures faces frequently so that we feel like we have to lean in just to sort of see what's going on with her. Um, and so there's only a smudge for her eye. We don't, we can't really see the rest. And then this gesture, you know, this, this body language is also very evocative. Um, the hand to the chin, you know, is that a, uh, a feeling of being startled or is she puzzled or is she just thinking? And it's, they're both sort of connected through this letter. And is this woman here to the left looking at her I and mean, what's going on in her face? Is it a, um, is she concerned? You know, she or she's emerged out of this darkness, right? So there's no backdrop here. You know, Vermeer has, has not given us any hints. There's no painting of Cupid. There's no painting of the sea or, it's just completely darkened. This is a later painting of his. And she sort of melds in with her brown hair. And again, she's wearing the maid's um, costume, but she's given such, um, life and such personality and you know very different than the other painting we saw where she's sort of the saucy uh, woman looking down um, here she's has she's very sensitively rendered um, and she shows her work her her hand you know her sleeves are rolled up right her cheeks are rosy um, even her forearm is slightly darker, meaning that she's been working a bit. And the whole idea about wearing this outfit, women in that time that were work, you know, working at homes uh, would wear darker brown. That's a brown wool because they didn't want to show um, dirt. So compared to the woman who here is wearing this light colored silk, you know, we have a woman who's definitely working with dirt and in the household. And even her apron would have been dark as it is here. Um, there are many questions around this painting as to what's going on between the two of them and what is in the letter. Um, 
it's not necessarily a love letter, although it could very well be, because that was, as I said, the trope at the time. But um, it's interesting to think that he's left this letter completely blank. There's nothing written on it. There's no even pretend. Um, although, and she is also the mistress of the house has been interrupted. So we're coming into this painting in um, temporarily, you know, in the, in the sense of, of time, we, you know, what is the before and what is the after of this painting? What has happened just before? Well, we know that she's been writing because the bottom here is a half written letter. Has she dropped her pen or has she rested it and been thinking and then the woman enters? What, what has happened before? And then what happens after? And I've always gotten this sense that they have quite an intimate relationship the way sometimes people do have with people that work for them in their home. Um, they know everything about their lives. And so um, it's interesting that Vermeer has given them this, this intimacy and that we're peering into it. So he creates that int intimacy through this obscuring, through the body language, through the way the you know, she's tilting, she's not upright, she's leaning forward and pushing that hand out. And then her left arm sort of, sort of disappears behind the apron. It's almost, you know, it's very interesting what he's done with her. Um, and the light, as I said before, you know, it comes in crescendos, you know, sort of descends down onto this table, which is the source of the mystery, the letter. And here, I just wanted to give you a close-up of um, their faces. Uh, he does this lovely thing in his painting technique, which I want to get into a little bit more. So, you know, as I said, he deals with pigments, but he technically, uh, he is amazing. If you were to see this in real life, you don't see a brush stroke. Um, and this is slightly blurry when I expanded it, so I'm sorry about that, but you can see moments where he's used impasto. Impasto is bits of paint that's been left thick on the paintbrush, and then they, the artist decides to leave that thickness on the surface, so it catches light in and of itself. But it also gives, you know, he uses it for highlights. So here we see it on the pearl and here, and you also see it on her lips, which he does with girl and a pearl earring. You know, that same highlighting. He's very particular about where he puts his highlights. And I think that's why his sense, the way we sense light is from this beautiful technique that he has. He's very discerning about where he gives sharp edges and where he gives blurred edges. So as I pointed out before, the letter has this wonderful sort of black edge to it. Um, and yet then with these faces, He's very purposeful in the way that he, he puts a glaze over it with a thin color on it and so that you can't see the edge of the other color. And so it becomes this sort of misty um, edge. And then almost that blurring gives a sense of motion, like maybe they're moving or we're moving as we're seeing it. So um, that it's very evocative uh, to see it. And here I'm um, just as... Uh, I showed you, this is Lapis Lazuli, and this is when it's, it's ground down, and this is what he painted with in order to give the maid this um, apron. And, you know, there's something to be said about giving the, the maid an apron that is literally materially expensive. Um, it's sort of meta, <laughs> in a way. Uh, uh, and I think it's very interesting. He could have given it to the mistress. So I, I think that's, and here we see this sharp edge here as well. Um, so, and then just to circle back to the idea that frequently the light always comes, you know, or not always frequently comes from the left in his paintings and frequently uh, you see the, the actual window. Um, here you actually do see the windows too. It's almost like he couldn't help himself. And where are they? They're in the reflection of these cups. So this is the mullions of the window. Here, which then adds another level of mystery because how could that reflection be here? Maybe the light is also coming from behind the artist as he was painting, right? Because that's in the front, and you know, he couldn't, couldn't really get this reflection perfectly from the left. Um, 
And, you know, with this left bit here, with this, um, the uh, tablecloth, it's funny that he should have left it bent. Like, why would he have done that? You know, is it to show off that he, like a Renaissance painter, can paint drapery and make it realistic? Or is it, or illusionistic? Or is it the sense that the artist has just been there or, and shoved it? So his signature is not there, but maybe it is. Because he did sign a lot of his paintings. Now, the thing that's really interesting was um, the painting was brought probably about four or five years ago to the Metropolitan. Um, you know, they frequently do this uh, for restoring, but also they, um, they put it through reflectography and macro x-ray um, fluorescence in order to see how the artist worked and what is beneath it. Um, and so we have an image here to the left of the Met's uh, conservation lab, which is amazing. And what was revealed um, was that there was originally a backdrop to this painting. Uh, and this, it's very hard to see, but they think it may have been a tapestry with multiple figures. I think there are about four that you can see. Um, that uh, unfortunately we don't know. No one really knows where, where it comes from. No one knows. They know that he had tapestries in his inventory, but they don't know what this would have been. So it is a great mystery, but what is not a mystery was that Vermeer ultimately decided to paint over it, which speaks to his later style. It speaks to his choice of refining and focusing the essence of his paintings down to you know, the relationship and the mystery. And um, very different, that is very different than his contemporaries and something that makes him stand out, I think, as an artist. Uh, yes, and I just wanted to talk briefly also, I forgot to mention his sense of, um, and here it is again, um, when it, after he painted it over. Uh, he used, many scholars believe that he used um, uh, an object called the obscura, I mean, camera obscura, which is a, a, a very, it's difficult to explain, but it's a light box with a pinhole in it. And when you look through it, you can see the reflection of the image. So it, it immediately transforms a 3D image that you're looking at in real life to a 2D image. And it also is able to blur edges in the way that a camera lens does in some ways. Um, the curators of the Frick don't believe that he used a camera obscura actually, um, and, but maybe he used it in some places and, and then not with other paintings, or maybe he used it as a source and then painted afterwards. It's hard to know. Um, it is interesting, though, that he knew at the time um, a scientist who was uh, a microbiologist, actually, who was very involved with lenses. And so he was exposed to that kind of uh, science at the time. So we're going to say goodbye to this painting. Uh, but please um, look at it on the Frick website if you have time. Um, and you can zoom in on your own and look at all the different details because I certainly haven't discussed everything in it. Uh, and please come to New York to see it when it comes back. Uh, so we are going to now go to our next painting. Um, this is by Giovanni Bellini. This is also one of the masterpieces of the collection. And it was one of Frick's absolute favorite paintings. Uh, it was in his show you in his living hall. Um, this is uh, what it looked like at night with just the light on it. And it was during a session with Rika Burnham, who was the head of education at the Frick for many, many years. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it's a very, very large panel. I just want you to get a sense of how big it is. Um, very unusual for Renaissance devotional painting to be this big. Uh, and um, beautifully rendered. So I'm just going to go back, look at it for a second. Um, it's oil and tempera, uh, mostly oil, done on poplar wood. So it has this wonderful, when you look at it up close, this wonderful sort of sheen to it, um, also with glazes, but also because it's on wood. Um, Frick uh, bought it in 1915. Uh, it's the only Bellini he owned, um, but he did um, buy Titian, as well. Um, and it's side by side here. Wait, I'll show you again. Uh, this is a Titian and this is Aretino, who was a poet 
at the time of Bellini's life, and Titian was the Giorgione's uh, follower, in a way, of Bellini's work. Um, so Bellini uh, was born in 1435, he died in 1516. This is, they think, an image of him taken, it's uh, a detail taken from another painting. Um, and Durer, Albert Durer, I'm sorry, I couldn't get the umlaut over the U, so for those of you who know his name. Um, uh, Durer, who was, you know, from Northern Europe, came through Italy and was in Venice, for, I think, for about two years. And he was younger than Bellini. And he said he's very old, and yet he is the best painter of all. So Bellini was much uh, appreciated at the time. Uh, he came from a family of painters. His father was Jacobo, uh, who created a workshop in Venice. And then his brother-in-law was actually Andre Mantegna. And uh, his brother was Gentile Bellini, all of them quite renowned painters at the time and are in Renaissance art quite well known. Um, oh yes, this is a detail, excuse me, from um, a portrait of a man. So there we are. Uh, he, um, so he learned quite a bit from his family. They actually don't know, interestingly enough, if Jacopo was the father or whether he was an older half brother. Uh, he, cause they, he learned a lot from Jacopo and then simultaneously then they were painting and, um, but there were all these model books that they would create. They were beautifully rendered drawings of, of, um, sort of Fantasia landscapes, but also, um, he observed botany very closely. He, um, um, and so he was, you know, a draftsman, a beautiful, beautiful draftsman at the time. He was also known among the wealthy Cittadini, uh, how do you say it? Well, anyway, Cittadini um, of, of Venice. Uh, he knew people that were part of the same um, uh, religious group that were all, um, and he was a part of that as well. So let me just scoop here. Let me go back to the painting for a second. Um, just want to circle back to something about his life. Um, yes, he was known, um, he was well known from a religious lay organization called the Scuola Grande di San Marco. Um, and that was a very well known organization. And so they think that perhaps this was painted for a man named Juan Miquel, who was part of that organization, um, uh, who was a, a very wealthy patron. And eventually, uh, and probably, I'm not sure, but probably for a private chapel of his, um, frequently wealthy uh, Venetians would have a large home and then they would have their own chapel where they would go and worship. Uh, and then um, eventually it was found, discovered, according to another art historian, uh, that it belonged to an, another uh, you know, some 50 years later, another person who actually had it in his gallery. So it was no longer than a devotional object per se, but also an object of art, which becomes an important idea. So this is an image of St. Francis of Assisi. And St. Francis is in um, Christian faith, uh, the patron saint of animals and nature. Um, he was eventually named the patron saint of the Environment and Ecology by John Paul II. Um, and he actually was a real person. Uh, he, here we are. he was born in 1181 and he died in 1226. So a good 200 years prior to the, this painting. Um, he was born, uh, St. Francis or Francis was born to a wealthy family in Assisi. Um, and he discovered that he wanted to leave that all behind and um, he wanted to follow the life of Christ. And so he founded the Franciscan order, it's a mendicant order that still exists today um, and is known for its habit that he is wearing in this painting um, of brown cloth with a rope that has three knots on it, which speaks to chastity, poverty and obedience. And he gave up all of his family's wealth and decided to travel the world, and he did, um, following the life of Christ and preaching the words of Christ. 
Um, and at one point he returns actually from Egypt. He takes, he goes out with the crusades, not with them, but while during the crusades and tries to convert people at the time. And he comes back um, and he decides his, his following has expanded so much that he just, he needs a place for people to be educated. And, um, and so he asks for this abandoned isle here uh, in the lagoon of Venice. And it still exists, um, San, San Francesco de, de, Sar, de Sarte. Um, and um, deserto means, in Italian, it means like deserted more than uh, desert. Okay, just so that, because um, uh, the title of the painting at the Frick is called St. Francis in the Desert, but it actually doesn't really mean that. It means in the wilderness. And it's had many different titles over its life. So, um, it actually means that he's in the wilderness. But nonetheless, this is where, um, and St. Francis, you know, it's interesting, it's called this San Francesco. It's named, you know, because St. Francis becomes a very important uh, saint to Venice. Um, and his name is on, in many churches. Uh, so here we have him um, in, a bucolic yet deserted area, right? Um, and Bellini has decided to document a moment actually in Francis's life where he does go out into the wilderness for 40 days to commune with God, to pray and meditate and to, um, you know, uh, connect with God. And, uh, he has come out here in this, in his robe, and he's left the world behind. Uh, he's left civilization and um, these these um, buildings that actually look quite a bit like a CC, but not quite. Um, hold on, I just want to ask a question. Eva Marie, you were frozen, so I'm wondering if I've frozen too. Hello? The connection may have gone bad, so I don't know whether to keep going or not. Let me just see. Ah, here we are. Are you back? We are back. I don't even know what happened. That was so bizarre. That's quite all right. I was glad I noticed it because I was going on and on. <laughs> okay. Well, and then I want to thank, um, somehow Zoom kept everybody together. So thank you for everyone who, who is still with us. Um, Olivia, please continue your okay. writing. At the part of this yeah. special occasion. <laughs> yes. So where we were, um, you know, actually, since I've um, stopped, I just want, there was a couple of questions um, that I want to address. Uh, oh, yes. Susan Delaney asked about, um, hold on, sorry that this is in front of the screen here. Asked about the map in the background of Officer and Laughing Girl. Um, should I address that now since I have the screen up? Um, sure, sure. Uh, whatever you'd like. This is your time. Sure. Okay, let me just see if I can get back there, Susan. Sorry, this is delaying on me. Hold on. Here we are. So, um, one of the um, viewers asked about this particular painting here. It's called Officer and Laughing Girl. And the map behind her head is actually has a lot of history to it. Um, it was a real map, they know, it was uh, made in 1631. And um, interestingly enough, and it, and it says it's an, it's quote unquote, an accurate map of Holland and West Friesland. That's what the writing is on the top. Um, and what's interesting, there are a couple of things that are very interesting about it. First of all, the blue, is really where the land is. So, and Vermeer has done that on purpose. He's inverted the blue so that the, um, instead of the sea being blue, which would have been, hold on, this, one, this would have been blue, he's made the land blue. And also the compass rose, even though it was an active thing to be using at the time, they didn't necessarily adhere that to maps at the time. And so the north is actually here, north, south, east and west. So if we were to look a map, a real map now, this, we would be looking at it, you know, tilt, it would be um, a vertical versus horizontal. Um, and 
it's very, um, we don't know why he's intersected her lovely, you know, face with this map. It's gone, goes completely horizontal across the picture plane in a wonderful way, very strong way. Um, but other to say, you know, that perhaps it means that he is opening this man here who's probably part of the Civic Guard. Um, perhaps he's opening the world to her. Perhaps she is a representation of, um, you know, the Dutch Republic, or perhaps it's just a map. Um, you know, there are many, many interpretations about it. So, um, and then uh, let's see, Marianne Yi said, how will the Frick collection of art be shown in a renovated mansion? Is it the way the Frick would have wanted the work shown? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, when it goes back to the mansion, they'll all be put back the way the bequest uh, asked for it. So um, for sure. And uh, in Mistress and Maid, does the note the maid is holding have a black edge? Maybe a notice of death. Oh. You know, it has a black edge, but it's not, it's not, uh, it looks more like a shadow. Hold on, let's go back. Uh, give me a minute. Let's see if we can get it closer. There we are. It has a black edge there, but it, then it turns to gray. But that is a very good question. I don't know. Um, uh, yep. Yeah. And so I think I've answered those. Was there one more? No, I think we're ready to continue with um, Bellini. Okay, good. Thank you. And, and I was going to say, remember, um, uh, students, you're welcome to submit your questions, and then we'll uh, be able to answer them at the end um, of learning a little bit more about Bellini. Um, so, um, Bellini. So here, okay, I think I was starting to say that, he, you know, um, Francis, so Bellini is created, he's, he's rendering this moment in Francis's life that was real, that he went, went, he actually went on a spiritual retreat into the wilderness and he leaves behind civilization and he goes out not only to fast, but to pray and commune with God very much in the way that Christ in the New Testament was led by the Holy Spirit to go into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights as a form of testing and renewal in a way. And he's left behind these towns that some sort of reflect his home, Assisi, they look a little bit, but they also look a little bit like Laverna which is in Tuscany and was the place of his retreat. Um, and I'll show you pictures of that in a minute. Um, and what he does is, it's very interesting. He, he creates separate paintings of this, like separate zones. So here's one zone of civilization and then this other zone of sort of the farming. And this is a shepherd with sheep. And then we have the animals and then suddenly we're sort of in this rocky sort of deserted area. But then he puts very interestingly enough, this sort of man-made lectern and it doesn't really make sense. And so then you think, well, it's man-made. It's not really the wilderness. What does that mean? Um, there, there's the natural world that definitely reflects uh, St. Francis's interests. You have this donkey in the center with his ears pricked something unusual. The shepherd in the back, which I'll show you a little bit more closely in a second, uh, he's looking out at us. It's a gaze out. You have a heron here who's sort of standing on this ledge. Um, Loverna itself, the mountains, are very, they're very steep and they do sort of go into these cavernous areas. So it's very rocky and very cavernous. And so he has this sort of falling off here, which reflects that natural world. But things are still not completely illusionistic in the sense of just observing that space, right? That space. Um, you have then assorted things that reference the Bible. Um, it is completely unknown whether these, um, this iconograph iconographic imagery is something that Bellini wanted, but it is definitely something he would have known of. Uh, at the time, uh, but we have here the skull, which is like a memento mori, it's a representation of death, and then rising up from it, hold on, I'm just my cursor, is um, this cross, 
which has the crown of thorns. So the cross that, according to Christian faith, where Christ was you know, crucified and that he was wearing the crown of thorns, which was a form of mockery to him as the king of, king of the Jews, as he was called by the Christians. And um, you have this uh, book here, which could and probably was a codex of some kind, maybe a Bible or something about, um, you know, about Christian faith. Um, hold on, I'm just going to move this up a little bit if we can. Whoops, sorry, one second. No, I can't. The bottom is cut off, but it, you can see it. Can you see the bottom, Ava Marie? You can, okay. So at the bottom here to the right are these sandals that he's left behind. And here on the upper right are these grape, grape vines, which very much uh, recall, you know, the passion, like during Christian service, you would have wine, um, which represents the blood of Christ. And this perhaps is a reference to the Old Testament, where Moses said, um, God says to Moses to take off his shoes when he is walking on holy ground. Um, we don't know if that's what he was thinking about. There may be other references, the fact that this rock starts to pool in some unusual way. It loses its solidity. and It looks more like water in a funny way, this icy blue. This is the original color, by the way. This has not been faded by time. Um, it's, uh, it's the original color. And uh, in the Old Testament, there's this idea that uh, Moses, again, is in the desert. He puts his staff into the the ground and water comes forth. Um, but again, we don't know if that is an accurate interpretation of these objects. Um, just a picture here of Laverna, Italy. Um, this is where he went into the wilderness. This is a chapel here, or the basilica, excuse me. It was built after Francis's life. And this is what it looks like to this day. You know, this sort of, this very interesting rocky formations. Um, and then here to the right is a 17th century rendering of the path of St. Francis. So they think that this is where he may have traveled while he was on this, you know, retreat. Um, and, it, you know, and to this day, I think they actually have pilgrimages that go through this area. Um, so the portrayal of Francis, oh, I want to bring up the animal world as well, because I hadn't really, um, discuss that, you know, you have this rabbit that he added. This has also gone through X-radiography. Um, uh, so this rabbit who peeks out, you know, this was painted in later. Um, and it's very interesting, it's right underneath his hand. So like, what does that mean? You know, um, you know, rabbits in Christian iconography have all sorts of meanings, but why is that one right there, right there, you know, under his hand? Um, we also have the donkey, which could be about humility. His, and he's standing very, he's very much in the center of the panel, which is kind of interesting and all alone, um, uh, you know, could be about humility. But then again, we have these markers of civilization. So perhaps he has walked away from his reading, from his words, from, from you know, man-made concepts of religion and spirituality and he's moved out into a space that is without words. Um, and on that note, if one looks at his pose with his hands outstretched and his body language, again, body language of, you know, his arching back as if he's receiving, you know, as if he's connecting to something is very emotionally rendered by Bellini and very well thought out. And the portrait of Francis is, is, seems like it's based on a real face. So he spent a great deal of time, um, here we see it more closely, uh, working on it. Uh, his process was very complicated uh, as an artist, Bellini gessoed the panel and then he would draw on it very much like the way, because um, he originally was a tempera painter. Uh, and then he, he sketched out very, very carefully the face and the, under the eyes and here, and when you see it up close, you can see where, he, where he's worked on it. Um, and so he's considered the face quite a bit and very different than sometimes a lot of portraits at this time or portrayals, excuse me, not portraits of uh, St. Francis. Um, 
And so he was thinking, you know, this open mouth, this eye is looking up, you know, it's, some people think it's as if he is singing. Um, Francis wrote poetry and songs. One very well-known one is called the, the Cattle of the Sun. So some people think this is a moment where he's actually singing this, this, this prayer or hymn to nature and to animals and the sun and the moon. Um, and, you know, then Bellini is so good with botany, right? He really has observed this beautiful plant. This is actually identifiable. It's the Jacob's Ladder. Uh, and it's like a sunflower. It, um, it closes at night and then it opens during the day. So it's interesting that vertically it's right next to him and it also parallels his stance a little bit, not completely, but a little bit. Um, you know, maybe this sense of rebirth that is around, uh, around him. Uh, let's see. And so more uh, these, I just want to show you the details that I was talking about. Um, here we can see on the far right, this, the cross. And then also this is beautifully rendered, um, but with impasto, very thin brush, and it goes up into a bell, this little string. And so the idea that he, when he was saying prayers, um, you know, there would be time for vespers and he would ring a bell. Um, and here we have the donkey. And here we have the shepherd, this idea that perhaps he, you know, is, um, you know, Christ is referred to as a shepherd and his flock. And so you have this image of these. And even the sheep here is looking straight out at us. And the shepherd is looking straight out at us. Sort of this idea of a moment, right? Um, and then this man made water spout. Now there's been some references to water spouts like this in Renaissance paintings being like the font of imagination but also it could reference holy water. Um, it's really unknown, um, but it's so, if it is, you know, the font of the imagination, it's funny that Bellini should have put his name right below it. Uh, that's just me. <laughs> Some scholars have actually written about where Bellini places his um, beautiful um, trompe d'oeil pieces of paper. He doesn't always use this as his form of signature, but here he's made it on a piece of paper that looks like it's just been blown on a, on a branch. And um, it is interesting that he's put it next to it. And right below it is a kingfisher, who, and that is actually a bird that would have been around water um, in that area, so interesting. Um, but one thing I haven't spoken to about is the light. Um, this, the light on this is very, very mysterious. Uh, if you go up to the top, and this is also Lapis Lazuli, by the way, um, and Venice was a portal. So it is no surprise that they would have gotten Lapis there, but very, very expensive again. Uh, and he saves it for the heavens, really. Um, and this, some people think, is a rendition of a sort of a heavenly Jerusalem. Um, it's hard to know, because uh, frequently also Bellini used blue to create a sense of distance um, <clears throat> with these two towns behind this laurel tree. But he does create this golden color coming and he stumbles, he, he drags the paint through to create these, this stream of light, excuse me, coming through that hits this laurel tree. And then sort of comes down to these rocks. And so you have this golden light around the towns, um, which, and then you have this sort of cooler blue light right around the rocks. So in some ways, they could be a shifting of time of day, even like golden afternoon light and then morning light. So maybe there are different times of day that are happening here. Maybe it is seasonally different the way these branches don't have any leaves on them, and yet this vineyard here, <laughs> these grapevines are lush. Um, and these trees around the um, Tuscan towns are very lush. So there's this confusing sense of what time of day it is, what season it is, um, and that maybe there are different worlds moving in at different times. It's very confusing. Um, but what is interesting here is also this laurel tree which is neither a tree nor a bush really and it sort of sways into and kind of replicates 
the swaying back of his body. So compositionally, it's very interesting. You have these two arches going on and that it hits the center here. And then a, this light is hit here. And we don't really know where this light source is. Like, is it from here? Is it from out of here? Coming down and descending on his chest and then hitting this laurel tree. Um, laurel tree, traditionally in Renaissance paintings often means something about truth and honesty. Um, you might remember it like the laurel branches around um, Caesar's crown. Um, and here we have a close up of the laurel tree and this beautiful work here that he's done very delicately pulling that, that light color through the blue. Um, so one thing you would not be able to see, even when you're looking at the painting, it's difficult to see this, but there are red dots on his hands, this one to the right. And um, which the, the amount of nature and detail that is in this painting speaks to it being a meditational piece, right? That is, um, some art, one art historian calls it a sort of poesia, that it responds to poetry at the time, it responds to this intellectual and humanistic environment that it was painted in, where you can look and you look and you look, and you can even discuss the objects that you're seeing and the environment and the world that you're seeing. So these tiny red dots are marks of the stigmata. And we know that because according to Christian faith in St. Francis's story, life story, he goes out into the wilderness and he has a moment where he communes so intensely with the Holy Spirit and God that he breaks out on the marks of Christ on the cross. Um, and those marks are on the hands and the two feet. And then there's a gash on the side. Those are the marks that Christ had on when he was crucified. Um, this happens uh, in Christian faith. This, is hap this happens to other saints, but it happens to St. Francis here. And what is the big quandary about the painting is whether this is in fact the moment of his stigmatization. Is this the moment, hold on, let me go back just a little bit here. Is this the moment where the Holy Spirit comes down and imprints those marks on his body? Um, and, it's, and it's written about, uh, let's just see if I can read it here, by um, one of his um, historians who lived probably about 30 years after his death. And he writes that a seraph with six wings, this is according to St. Bonaventure, who wrote about the event. Um, his arms were extended, his feet conjoined, his body was fixed to a cross. Two wings were raised above his head and two were extended as in flight. Um, the face was beautiful beyond all earthly beauty and it smiled gently upon Francis. So that's in speaking to the seraph that would have been up here, right? This is a six wing angel. So, Oh, wait a minute, here we go, there we go. Uh, so um, this is um, another painting done about 100 and plus more years prior to Bellini's. It is of the actual event of the stigmatization of St. Francis by Giotto um, uh, in the Bardi Chapel. And here we do see this six-winged seraph and these sort of strobes of light that have come down and given him the marks. And then again, we have Van Eyck, who is probably 40 years prior to the painting that Bellini does. Um, he's in Northern Europe, so we see Northern European city. Uh, he also has a set, sixth wing seraph. So, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six wrapped around him. Um, and the marks of the stigmatization. And here he's with Brother Leo, which according to the history, the narrative, excuse me, um, Brother Leo is a, a follower of him that was with him at the time. Um, we don't know. We don't know whether this is the moment of the stigmatization or whether this is just an incredible moment of intense communication with the Holy Spirit and nature and God. And, um, and I think it speaks to Bellini's sense of actually Francis's humility, that if it were the stigmatization, it is rendered with such a humble take, you know, that he is only half the size of the panel 
um, the marks are barely perceptible. And he is more, more importantly, he is surrounded by a landscape that is huge in the picture plane and detailed and lush and makes you admire nature all the more. So um, on that note, I think I will end, but I will answer some of these questions that were in the, uh, in the chat. Is that good? Uh, yes, I, but first before I, we, you stop sharing, I wanna uh, just point out one thing that I also find the subtlety and beauty with Bellini and that is how you can see a slight form of his leg, you know, kind of echoing the body of St. Francis going back. Yes. And, and it, that, I mean, to me, that's, that's so beautiful because that tends to be something that we uh, see for sure, you know, with sculpture, you know, and, and, and when you think of like Hellenistic sculpture, uh, for example, that wet drapery, and here he gives it so subtly, and I yeah. just, yeah. Yes, and you know, and you know, sculpture at the time, of course, you know, we're in the Renaissance, um, you know, he was looking at sculpture, and, and he was a great observer of, of the body, and um, definitely you see him uh, observe, there is a body under that cloak, there is right. a body. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 um, I just I just find that that's all just so beautiful. So yeah, um, no, there's so many things. The way he does the tufts of grass that come out, you know, the way that happens when something is coming out, like you know, it's it, this like the season that we're going through now, which is you go through Central Park and things kind of look like this, where they're partly awakening. You know, some of it is right. lush, and some of it is not. Um, yes, his ability to um, sculpt is amazing, his sense of architecture. And not only that, I, I don't think I pointed out, but he was one of the first painters that were recording art history, um, one of the first to really take on the Northern European use of oil paint um, and really, really go to town with it, um, create these beautiful greens. I mean, there's so many different levels of green here. Um, and, and, you know, this to this little bright piece in here to this different color here and then this ashy gray here, I mean, green here. So it, um, it's remarkable, actually, what he does with oil being a new technique um, that then eventually, you know, of course, goes to Florence and, you know, really is the main, the main technique. Sure. So so here's just a couple of uh, questions first about this painting, and then there's some other questions about the Frick collection itself. Um, one, um, what, Sue wanted to know about the skull on the, the lectern. Yes, yeah, so the skull is um, most likely it's a me memento mori, uh, which means it's a reminder of death. Uh, and here, you know, because you have this whisper thin cross coming out of it, it could be this whole idea of life after death, right? That through the resurrection of Christ, death is then conquered. Um, uh, and then, you know, and frequently in Renaissance paintings and very early ones, you frequently see the skull at the base of uh, portrayals of the crucified Christ. So it would make sense that he would have that there in the place where he is contemplating uh, death and resurrection and the life of Christ. So. Uh, yes, and and I I see even the placement of the skull by you know the crucifixion above. You know you can kind of see right. that perhaps yeah. Right. I think I have an image of it. Hold on, let me see. Well, and and again, I just love when you yeah. look at paintings, um, oh, no. not just with Bellini but others of this time, just the rich symbolism. And you know how to pulling them together and then making connections of um, absolutely. So another question a student had was, did Saint Francis live in a cave? Ah, uh, that is a great question because the cave here is so dark, um, and it, and it's very confusing and very mysterious. Um, and I always like to think of this cave as sort of like the on the place where he is not less connected to the Holy Spirit, you know, a place of spiritual um, unawakening versus awakening, um, you know, because there are no details back there. No, um, he, he could have lived, yes, um, according to his um, hagiography, he um, lived in a cave actually in Laverna, 
um, but not full time. He was mendicant, meaning that he traveled all over Italy and, um, you know, preached the, the words of Christ. So he would go to many different towns and cities, and he actually even traveled to the Middle East and Egypt. So um, his whole idea was to travel around. Well, and one student brought up a good point. I mean, could this be um, where he's in, in front of like a symbolism of the tomb of Christ? Yes, very much so. Um, but you know, there, this symbolism could go on and on because no one really yeah. knows. No one really knows. And um, so, you know, there have been all these different studies about like, could it be this, could it be that? And um, yes, I mean, you know, I have often wondered about these three uh, tree branches because they look like Golgotha. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. It could very well be this. And then this overhanging bit here could very much be like the tomb of Christ. Yeah, absolutely. And also in the rendering of the tomb of Christ, mm -hmm. instead of the up close, well, the ones, they have this sort of horizontal lentil, lentil piece over cool. the So, yeah. Cool. Up on top. And so um, another student asked about what is tucked in St. Francis's belt. Uh, you have some very observant. Uh, yes. students, my goodness. <laughs> yes, we don't know. We have been trying to figure that one out for a long time. It could be a, what they call a chartula, which is sort of like um, Franciscans might make notes of things they either need to do or think about. Um, you know, it's very, uh, and there is some kind of faint writing on it, but it's not really writing. It's very confusing. Um, no one really knows. <laughs> well, um, now I, I'd like to, um, kind of ask some questions about with the, the Frick collection um, in itself. One student asked uh, to get us started, um, it would be to, um, what are the, when are the borrowed items gonna be returned back to New York? That's a really good question. Um, when the exhibit ends, it will come back to New York. And I'm not sure when that exhibit ends, but I would think by the summer, mid-summer. I don't know though. I mean, but soon, they'll be back in the fall for sure. I know that, so. Okay, excellent. Um, and so my question is, because you had mentioned early on of how the Frick family or Mr. Frick was collecting at a time when these other families were collecting. Mm -hmm. um, so did he have an, an art advisor other than his wife or did they, oh, yeah. and, and that must have been a little cottage industry with these art advisors, with these families. Oh yeah, no, it was a big time cottage industry. <laughs> so there were art dealers uh, and he got a lot of advice from Duveen and Nodler. Nodler galleries still exist to this day. Um, and then he also like uh, from art historians, Bernard Berenson would you know be a consultant to Isabella Gardner and Frick and a bunch of other people because he was a, you know, a, an expert on basically Italian Renaissance art. Um, yeah, and they would compete. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say. Yeah, so Gardner, yeah, so Isabella Gardner, and, you know, uh, competed with Rick all the time. Uh, not all the time, I, I'm exaggerating. But, you know, I think there was a tussle over the Rembrandt self-portrait and- Right. Well, I, I, with that, comp that competition then would probably drive up prices. And their wealth was well known. I mean, you could go a lot of different ways with that kind of thing. <laughs> so although it became more like it was coming, yes, it would drive up the price for sure. Um, but I think it was also first dibs on a certain level too. But it was the price, definitely the pricing they would do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah excellent. Well, a couple more questions has come in because we're still looking at this beautiful painting by um, Bellini. Um, so here's another question, the cave. Could it mean the transformation from darkness to light? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Uh, that's sort of what I was sort of saying about him going in there, sort of not, uh, yes, definitely. The whole literal darkness of that space with the darkness underneath here, the water area here, you know, the darkness that is not, you know, being exposed to the holy light. So yeah, this idea of awakening. Right. Um, and another question is, can you explain again about the blue uh, rocks looking like they're melting? Yeah. So, you know, in a funny way, this isn't very art, art history speak, but they kind of look like ice cubes in a funny way. If you just 
you know, shift your mind in that direction. And, you know, because they have this icy blue. And then, right, can you see my cursor? Uh, yes. Okay, so right down, you know, down towards the middle bottom of it, right here, it gets very like swirled. It gets softened. The rock, the rock has a pattern that is wavy versus like geometrical. And so in some ways it looks as if the rocks are melting, as if it's pooling into a form of water. And then eventually becomes water as it trickles mm -hmm. off the spout. And so it perhaps is, you know, again, you know, all these glosses or glosses, right? We don't know, um, could be this idea of it, of, you know, of Moses, you know, breaking into the desert and, you know, getting water out of the desert. It could be a reference to the Old Testament. Right. Excellent. And um, again, with the symbolism, we can go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> and on um, and we don't know you know we don't know i wish bellini had left us a letter right i mean this is what i meant and they're not too they're not too many um comparables you know they're not too many other objects that we can say oh this is definitively what this is i mean we know like grapevines yes that is definitively you know the skull yes the cross for sure um but the rest is a little bit more Right. And and another student uh, uh, put in as a question about even just with, you know, the donkey, you know, being as perhaps a, a, a sign or uh, for humility. Yes. When, you know, yes, so. definitely. And or it could also be a reference to Mary and um, Joseph's flight to Egypt. Oh, yes. So, you, know, you know, you could go really like there are a lot of things you could go to and maybe that's what Bellini intended mm -hmm. you know anyways, is for people to look at it and and have it you know the fact that the towns are unidentifiable is also interesting right like yeah. they kind of look like Assisi they kind of look like Laverna but you know he could easily have put something in there to make them identifiable yes well I, I also tell uh, my art history students you know that these are very um implied deductions <laughs> <laughs> right you know uh, some very research deductions but again all implied because we very rarely have the actual words right uh, you know from and, and, until we get to the early uh, 20th century or, uh, where we start to see the manifestos right exactly you know, you know exactly. That, that yeah yeah that come out I mean, um, you know, could there be could be you know, that he knew about alberity and the idea that variety is important, you know, I, yeah, possibly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, and, and then perhaps this could be a subject for another day, you know, the travels of these artists. You know, right. we, we, when we just look at a painting, we tend to isolate it, but not realizing uh, what I've often said, the transfer of knowledge. Right. You know? How does that transfer? And then you find out that these artists traveled they were very well aware of each other, wouldn't you say? Oh yeah, definitely. And also, um, they 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 tried to see each other's work, so they would go to churches and and see each other's work. And and they had these model books, as I mentioned before, where they would sketch things and then they would sketch other artists' things. And so they had references to uh, to objects. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, I mean, you're welcome to stop, um, uh, share if you'd like, and we can continue uh, our conversation. Uh, it's up to you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, sure. Um, so I also wanted to um, ask a little bit more with the Vermeer. Do we know about his process for painting? I mean, do we have drawings? I know we don't have very little on him, but do we know anything about that? Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know of any drawings. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't exist, but as yeah. far as my knowledge goes, I don't know of any. Um, we, we know so little. We know about uh, him laying down the paint and sketching it out with paint. So, um, you know, he would frequently use a lighter ground and then put a darker ground on it. Um, but no, no sketches. Right. No, I find that very intriguing. Yeah, Bellini would sketch because um, 
he would put down a gesso, a white gesso, and because of temper, you had to be very careful. You know, the temper dries so quickly. Mm -hmm. You had to know exactly where you were going. Mm -hmm. and so some of his technique holds over into his oil technique. Um, and I think there is some temper in that painting, actually. Excellent, thank you. Now, you also mentioned how Mr. Frick uh, had two, yeah, he ended up building two galleries in his house when he was alive for his collection. No, so I'm so sorry. The, the yeah. West Gallery, so, you know, his intention was to build this home, was to be a gallery for his, to hold his collection. He mm -hmm. always knew that the collection would go into the house. So even though he had the living room and the living hall and the library, he also made sure that all the bookcases were, you know, below elbow height so he could have paintings in there. He knew that the Fragonard room was, uh, was going to be a drawing room and it was going to have these large paintings of some kind. Mm -hmm. So, um, and he, the only established gallery was the West Gallery, which was the one I think I showed you, which was all green and, um, right. and he did, that was in the original um, okay. floor plans. Then um, when his wife died and he knew, he put in his will that after his wife died, it should be open to the public, mm -hmm. uh, his home and the collection. And that happened in 1935. But however, prior to that, um, they decided to extend the house after his death. And so um, they added on the East Gallery and the Garden Court which is this lovely sort of Italian eight gar uh, garden, interior garden with an age yeah. ceiling. And uh, it's a, more like a fountain, very peaceful, beautiful area. And actually that was designed by John Russell Pope who designed the National Gallery of Art. So there's this overlap again yeah. of melon to frick. Um, uh, and then in the seventies, they then added again uh, the, I think the reference library was built or they took on a building that was already existed and there was some of that in there. I'm unclear about that actually. Okay. So then with his gallery and with his intention, and I, I guess could this be the same thinking with all of these families with the, their growing art collections is that, um, it, was it a point of like showing off for my friends? Like I have this, you don't. Um, I mean, I can't imagine how awesome, well, awesome, okay, that's not a very academic word. Uh, but if you think about it, if you were friends with all these families going to all their homes and seeing all these masters. <laughs> yes, <of course. laughs> I mean, you know, Frick had a very contentious relationship with Carnegie, Andrew mm -hmm. Carnegie. And, you know, sure enough, some 20 blocks north is Andrew Carnegie's building, which is now the Cooper Hewitt. Um, and, you know, that had been built prior to Frick's home. Um, and, you know, he, he definitely wanted his building to be within competition. And he noted that in his letters. Okay. No, so definitely there was that idea. He took on um, J.P. Morgan's uh, family, uh, showed their work at the Metropolitan. They showed them the Fragonards at the Metropolitan. And then soon after that, it, they came on the market and he bought them from. So, you know, they all were in it together. Oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh that, 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 now that is a great story. I guess, you know, that- if you're But I mean, the Morgans wanted that, you know, then we were selling them, so it was all right. Okay. <laughs> but that's great. Did, um, and then you mentioned that the last premiere that he purchased was done in 1919 yes. uh, for a sizable amount more. Was that because Vermeer was becoming a little bit more well known or was that because of the war? Um, and then mostly remember. because, no, Vermeer started becoming much more well known. I mean, by the 1880s, there was this art critic and writer um, who really sort of, quote unquote, rediscovered him, uh, Vermeer. And you know, then suddenly everybody was talking about Vermeer and um, looking at his work, and you know, so that's not such a long distance. You know, it's what forty years or something uh, to nineteen nineteen. Mm -hmm. So he became and, very popular. And then again, when he um, passed away, what other, uh, or I should say, because you mentioned a few uh, sprinkled throughout your lecture, but what were some of the conditions um, that generations after him have to adhere if they want, you know, the collection to remain public. 
Right. So um, one of the big things is that, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't move the painting. So the Bellini won't be able to even be moved to the West Gallery. It has to stay in the living hall. Uh, and um, that's why this whole idea of the Frick Vermeer is going to the Rijksmuseum was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, they've had at the Frick, they've had the Moritz House uh, exhibit, which the Moritz House, which is a museum in Holland, um, brought over some of their amazing Dutch paintings. And um, the Vermeers were, be were able to be moved to the West Gallery and then the Mart's House collection was added on, you know, was, it was interspersed and it was a right. really cool exhibit. The Girl with the Pearl Earring came. Oh, um, wow. Right, that was pretty cool. Um, but uh, what other restrictions are there? Um, it's, that's one of the biggest. I would say that Helen Clayfrick, his daughter, who added on, you know, to the collection, her particular tastes were in Renaissance Italian. So the Bellini is one of, one of the few, uh, maybe it's the only even, that Frick himself bought. And oh. the other Italian Renaissance paintings that you see in the collection, are most of them are from her. From, from hers. Uh, well, yeah. one student asked, um, in uh, Finoa, Finoa, Finoa's, Fiona's rather, excuse me, in Fiona Davis's novel, The Magnolia, Magnolia Palace, the Frick is used for a backdrop of a Vogue model shoot. And does that kind of thing happen today? That's a great question. No. <laughs> well, and that's actually, a easy answer, but <laughs> actually, no, I take it back. Uh, that's totally wrong. Um, they very rarely do. They do. There was actually a really great partnership with a film school, students in a film school up in Harlem, I think. And they got permission because it was a partnership with the Fricks, um, with the Frick, to mm -hmm. film a student film in the Fragonard room. But it's very, very unusual. Um, you can, uh, you know, people some very rarely have private events there. Mm -hmm. um, they do. Uh, uh, so that kind of thing does happen, but it's unusual. Yeah. So I can imagine then with the Frick collection because of the paintings can't be moved, it's almost as if art historians around the world and, and curators around the world know well, that's at the Frick, we won't get it. I mean, well, actually, will there be exceptions? Yes, totally. So okay. the way <laughs> that Helen, uh, Helen Clay, Clay Frick, you know, she probably took on a third of the collection now and they're beautiful pieces. Um, I mean, they're just as important, if not more than the core collection. Um, they are allowed to travel because she got them after his death. So okay. they're not part of the bequest, you know. Uh, yeah, so they travel. And they travel. Oh, okay. a, a beautiful Angra that that you know travels is on loan, yeah. goes on loan, and yeah. Oh, well, that that that's great. That's great for other people, you know, yeah. around the world. <laughs> um, but and then I would like to ask: Are any of the uh, Frick family descendants uh, part of the the collection museum? Yes, they, through um, the decades they have been on the board, and um, yes, definitely not. Presently, although up until just very recently, yeah. Excellent, excellent. And so when, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the ending of the renovations and what are some exciting things that, that we can look forward to, especially when we head back to New York? Um, so we, I, they haven't told us when it will be done. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, there's lots of information on the website, yeah. but, uh, you know, the hope is somewhere in 2024, but we don't know, uh, you know, it's construction. Yeah. Uh, they, um, what to expect the, it's going to the, the house itself, the mansion itself is very much intact. Um, things that were added after Frick died, I think the music room, uh, which was a, an oval room that will be changed. Uh, the, and um, the what's the best thing is that the bedrooms will now be galleries. They were offices, and now oh. yeah, the second floor that were bedrooms became offices, and are now going to be galleries. And so there'll be more art to be seen. Oh, that that is exciting. And it's going to be in very intimate rooms because those mm -hmm. rooms are quite small. So that will be really pretty and uh, 
have windows looking out on the park and it will be very, I think it will be beautiful. Uh, yeah, what was the other thing? And you'll be able to go up the stairwell, which is a very lovely staircase. So that, that will all be good. And then there'll be a cafe. So many people, you know, they get museum fatigue, fatigue, and you know, there's a place to get a coffee. This way, you, excuse me, this way you can get a nice coffee. Yes. Uh, there are going to be some more um, educational programs because there'll be more space. So for that as well. Excellent. So here's a question um, that came in um, is, um, are European countries wishing to have the paid, uh, to have the paintings of the citizen, for example, like the return of things to Greece, but so do you, do you, do you, in your, in the for collection, do you have to worry about that idea of like repri uh, repatriation or anything? Repatriation, not really, not that I know of. Um, now that's because you he legally purchased. I mean, from yeah, oh, yes. documentation and yeah, and the oldest piece we have is probably from 1309, and that was so broken apart in the 1700s from a church that then was you know those pieces were sold for some of it was sold for the church you know the church right, right to raise money uh, yeah yeah so um, yeah I don't think that has become a big issue for us yet, but um, I don't know. <laughs> well, we don't have any antiquities in the collection, so. So, so that, that definitely helps, you know, and, and, and makes it a little bit easier, perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. For sure. Well, um, Olivia, um, I, I just want to thank you so much for this wonderful journey and the up close of both Vermeer and Bellini's and this insight to the Frick collection. And uh, we eagerly anticipate its opening. Um, so we'll keep abreast. Uh, may I um, uh, share your email if students have additional questions? Um, uh, yes, actually, which, which one do I, did I give you? I, uh... you? You gave me both, but we can do um, either one and you can just let me know which one. So yes. therefore, students, if you have any further questions, um, I'll put that on our Canvas um, module uh, for you as well. And again, we can, can you go can welcome to continue the conversation amongst each other in the discussion board, which opens up at 2 p.m. today, and then also your thoughts and impressions, uh, which will also open up at 2 p.m. as well. And then real quickly, uh, just a last reminder, next week, St. Patrick's Day, uh, we're going to have Professor Guy Biner, who is the Sullivan Chair or Director of Irish Studies at Boston College, and he will be talking to us about the harp as an iconic symbol of Irish historical memory. So we're looking forward to that. But again, this was fabulous to be able to go to New York and uh, not have to go to an airport. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so no crowds, no crowds. Yeah, no <laughs> crowds, yes, yes. But thank you for this insight uh, to the Frick Collection and what it meant to live with this art, you know, in addition. So have everyone, everyone have a safe week and we'll see you next Friday. Thank you. Thank you.